I'll start then by asking each of our writers, um, starting with Deborah, just to say a little bit about what form means to them. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, my first experience of uh, form was actually being punished for it because at my junior school, when I was seven, we had to write in exercise books. And uh, so you can imagine the page, no margins. And we were told to start at the left-hand corner and fill up the whole line, no gaps apart from you know all the usual gaps, until we got to the right-hand corner and then start again. And um, I found this, this made me very anxious. I found that I couldn't really do that. And I would start on the second line, uh, the third line. So I left a gap at the top of the page. And then at my junior school, I don't think we paragraphs were allowed either. <laughs> and in some, some weird way, I know this sounds very romantic, like, you know, a schoolgirl having her first encounter with the way leaving spaces on the page is a way of organizing our thoughts, is a way of thinking. But it actually made me very anxious. I got very anxious having to write this big block of text. And um, the teacher used to write, don't waste space, <laughs> don't waste space. <laughs> Much late, and then I was sent to the headmaster with the exercise books because it looked like disobedience. But I didn't want to be a rebel. However, it was just a kind of intuition about um, thinking, organizing, um, and, um, and all of that. And the headmaster actually slapped my ankles. Uh, I had to, I had to pulled down my socks, and he slapped my ankles. So I got punished for my first formal uh, <laughs> experiment. And I've written about that in my uh, writing memoir, Things I Don't Want to Know. Uh, and then the only other thing for now I have to say about form is that when I wrote Swimming Home, I knew that I wanted it to be chronological, but there would be one rupture in time and that I would set that up right from the very beginning so that the reader got a kind of sneak peek of something that was going to happen in the future. And that was a, uh, a new idea for me to, to sort of begin a car journey in which I would repeat uh, information that we'd heard before and then add new information, and that there would just be this one rupture in what was a, is a very chronological uh, novel. Thank you. Francis. I suppose I, form has a slightly different meaning if you're a poet. Um, if somebody asks you if you write in form, as a poet, the answer is not automatically, obviously, well, of course I do, we all do. Although, I'll come around to this, I think it is actually the obvious answer. But they're, they're asking you about whether you work in traditional received forms or not. So I think for poets particularly, I, mean, I don't speak for um, prose writers, but for poets particularly, form is an incredibly slippery word. It's a protean word. It's a word that every poet uses in a different way and every critic uses it in a different way. The word form may recur throughout a critical essay on poetry in many different guises, meaning many different things. I suppose to start with is the question of what form do you write in, as in do you write non-fiction, do you write poetry, do you write short stories? Then you're into generic differentiation. So form in poetry might be used to denote are you writing lyric poetry, are you writing narrative poetry, etc. You've got the question of the received form. Are you, are you writing in metre? Are you writing a villanelle, etc.? Then it gets more interesting after that, I think, mm -hmm. um, because you're on to questions of really any aspect of patterning and shaping a piece of writing that you're doing. So your decisions about line length, even if they're not driven by metrical concerns, they are formal decisions. Um, your decision about how long to spend on a particular image, 
is a formal decision. That changes the shape of the poem. It changes its sense of duration and proportion. Um, ultimately, I suppose I come down to, on, on the side of really the final sense of form, which is the all-encompassing sense of form, insofar as I would say that there is no decision that you make when writing a poem that is not a formal decision. And I think um, well, there's a poet called Peter MacDonald whose criticism I think is fantastic. I love his poetry too. And he said a great thing. He said that um, in the end, there is nothing a poem would rather be than the words it is. Um, and he's a wonderful formalist. He's a wonderful st student of form and critic of form. And I think that idea of form as being the totality of the artwork is something I'm committed to and, and very interested in. Mm -hmm. well. I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, make it new. Uh, I work in the novel form, mo mostly for fiction, though I write short stories as well. And I've written other stuff, I've written plays, I've written screenplays, whatever. Um, to my way of thinking, I mean, I think it, the break from what Francis has said is that it's respectable in poetry to write a sonnet or write a villanelle. But if you pick up a novel... It's also hotly debated. Maybe hotly debated, but it's not... You're not, you know, a, a novel should be novel. Uh, you know, or else it's not a novel in a sense. And if you pick up a novel and it's too mired in a received form, then it's an instant indication that it's not really going anywhere, frankly. Uh, you know, it may be okay as an entertainment, but it isn't a serious novel. Uh, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself. Every time I sit down to think about writing another novel, I've got to reinvent the wheel because that's what the form demands. Uh, you know, so questions of... Uh, I mean, what mostly interests me... and, and you know, I mean, I, I think Lavinia slightly laid down a marker that we, we weren't too, too theoretical, but I dispute that. No, I don't only understand how we can discuss form and tension without theory. Uh, you know, uh, what it, what is the form? Uh, what is the tension, and how do we respond to that? And for me, the tension that is being the novel form is being subjected to at the moment is a major social transformation, social and technological transformation. So that's the interesting thing to me, largely. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be a general who's fighting the last war. Uh, but that's the way I view it. Every time you come to write a novel, you have to think to yourself, why chapters? Why word spaces? You know, why pages? Why characters? What am I going to do with time? What am I going to do with chronology? What am I going to do, you know, everything. Everything is up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Therefore, form is, is perpetually inchoate in that way for me. Yeah, no, I, I'd just like to say that, <laughs> um, <laughs> that I didn't, what I meant was that this was, um, you were not expected to come and discuss um, the kind of academic theory of the novel, but the theory, yeah, theoretical, be theoretical. Um, there are no markers. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Would you like to say anything? Um, hello, is this working? Okay. Um, similarly um, to what Will said, I suppose, is that, that I, I'm not sure about seriousness. Um, I think more and more I enjoy games that are just openly played. Um, so for me, I think, especially once you've chosen something like fiction, then form becomes this game with all of these rules that just break really nicely under your individual weight. Um, you can play around with characters, you can play around with voice, like everything that has been already established. But I also think that there's a relationship between form and genre. Um, I probably see this more clearly in um, the films that I watch. I just, I think I just get a lot more satisfaction out of form when it's been disrupted. Um, so I, I, I watch a lot of film noir, I watch a lot of romantic comedies, the screwball ones, and I see the ways in which a film noir could just be 
a couple of degrees lighter and it would be a romantic comedy. Um, so just little flips like that um, I like to watch for. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> I think that we should talk more about about the ludic and the sort of seriousness of of play actually in in, mm. in finding new forms and or finding the form we're looking for. Um, Philip. Well, I think that's a really good point because if you're not enjoying it yourself, mm. no one else is going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if you're just ch churning <laughs> along. Well, I think it is true. true. I agree with Philip. Uh, no, I think it's true, and and uh, I know that because I started out. I mean, I started out writing biography. That was my first two books were pretty much straight biographies, or actually, that's probably exactly the wrong word to use. They were very queer biographies, but um, um, but they uh, the, the 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 form of biography I found I started not to have fun because I was constricted mm. by it because my voice was constricted by it, but the place of me in it. I mean, I couldn't describe the fact that the reason why I knew Catherine Hepburn s said something about Noel Cow is because I'd been summoned to Catherine Hepburn's upper Brownst brownstone house in the Upper East Side and been entertained by her for three and a half hours, you know, and she tried to feed me crab meat out of a fridge, which had been is half this open. true? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I couldn't put any of that in, you know, mm. so... So, and that's uh, why I've evolved what I write. That's really, that's really principally why I write mm. what I write, and I don't know what the f that form is. As you say, sort of creative nonfiction is a really ugh yeah. term. It's like I did some, uh, uh, a panel with Jeff Dyer in uh, the Wellington Festival in New Zealand, and he said, you know, no one calls poetry nonfiction, you know, <laughs> or, 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 you know, I mean, it's, it's such a, a, a weird term. But I've just read a really wonderful book by, I think, a Berlin writer called Sten Nadolny, called The Discovery of Slowness. Yeah. Unbelievable book, which is a kind of, uh, has anyone here read it? Mm -mm. Oh, you'd love it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fictionalized biography of John Franklin, mm -hmm. the, the, the non-discoverer of the Northwest Passage. Uh, I just really recommend it as, uh, as, a, as someone who's taken you know, the bones of this person's life and then mm. invented a life underneath it, which is all about the notion of slowness, uh, 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 which militates against the whole sort of uh, momentum of the century through which he, he had this amazing life. He started out as a uh, fort in Trafalgar, went with Matthew Flinders to discover Van Diemen's Land and southern Australia, and then ended up being... Love, uh, Governor General of, of Van Diemen's Land before perishing in the Arctic. And the amazing thing about this book is, is that it only deals with his most famous exploit in about 10 paragraphs at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Fantastic book. But th th I think, that, and also as Will says, you know, you, you have to keep reinventing it. Every, you, you, have to re you have to reinvent yourself mm. with each new mm. piece of work, I think, in a way. Especially if you're a... Uh, 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 publishing books, like substantial books, um, all my books take five years to write, you have to present a new persona to sell that book in a way, you know, to to uh, carry it in a way, you know, you have, you have to have a new story, really. Yeah, it's true. I'm interested <laughs> in, in when you talk about writing the biography and, and adhering or and making yourself adhere and it, to the conventions of that and mm. finding it unnatural. Mm. And then finding this new form with Leviathan and so on, which the active investigation of the subject. So you would have included Catherine Hepburn and mm. the poisonous crab meat. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it, would have had, it would have had a very serious purpose, um, which you would have discussed. Exactly. Which would have served exactly. somehow exactly. along the way. Um, in the introductory paragraph to this theme that you were all sent, I, I asked a lot of questions, and they're none of them are questions I have answers for. They're just uh, just the sort of questions that <coughs> I think we are expected to ask about form um, somehow. But I think they're quite useful questions to, to travel. Um, so I'm going to put one to each of you and see what happens. Deborah, are we creating new forms? <laughs> They're very simple questions. <laughs> yeah. Are we creating new forms? I sometimes find that I have to attempt something that everybody else has done 
and that I've never wanted to do. So this is actually sort of going, this is almost the opposite of your question, by which I mean, um, instead of innovating, throwing up um, uh, an exciting new form, I find that I have gone back to um, to something very old. For example, this is a, this is this is quite a uh, this is a tiny example. In swimming home, I needed to establish the villa in the south of France, where this book is set. I've never really wanted to do that. I don't really want to describe the villa. There are all sorts of other things I want to do. However, I was thinking about uh, The Great Gatsby, and there's no way that book could work if we didn't have, uh, you know, the Gatsby, the Gatsby Mansion. And why I needed to go back and sort of figure uh, sort of convince myself, no, I had to do this, was because I wanted uh, one of the characters to see um, a small boy walk through the walls. And if I didn't establish the walls, if I didn't make them solid in the first place, I was going to lose uh, I was going to lose that, and so um, so I go back to to make something to make something new. Um, in terms of biography and um, and all of that, I, I'm finding that writing in the first person, which is very difficult for me, I much prefer the third person, has made me think about. Uh, perhaps new forms more, because it, it, it seems to me that when we write in the first person, what we're creating is a, a, is a formal intimacy, what appears to be a formal intimacy with the reader. But the thing is, it's as constructed as anything else. It's actually got... Um, uh, how can I put it? It's got more artifice in it, in my view, than than the third person. So this incredible, this this this, this closeness that we feel with the first person um, is really to do with a a, a a a kind of formal detachment too. It's, it's sort of peculiar, and I'm thinking about that. Um, because the first person is very popular at the moment, and I don't really like it. So I'm trying to figure out how to use it differently. Mm. So it becomes a, a matter of testing the, the sort of positioning, yeah, the relative positioning. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Francis, um, should form be under tension, and is it tension? <laughs> can I have that first question? Yeah. <laughs> you, you can tell me to go. <laughs> um, well, yes, but I, I mean, I guess I think I've partly covered that a little yes, bit already in, in the discussion before when we were talking about yeah. that sense of my sense of a, a poem needing to be just at the point of breaking apart, really. Yeah. Um, and the some of the different kinds of tension we mentioned before, to do with line and syntax being in tension with each other. Um, I think. I mean, I think one of the ways, perhaps, just stepping back a little bit from poetry, it, it might be be considered to be form under tension would be the way poetry exists in tension with other forms that are available in the world. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting time at the moment, isn't it? And Will's mentioned this already in terms of technological change. The types of forms of writing and information that are out there, um, there's lots of new types available. Um, and creative writers have to think about how they engage with those new types of forms mm. and to what extent they allow them into the work that they're doing. So stuff like emails or social media profiles or Google search results or whatever. Um, you know, there's a whole movement in US poetry called fluff poetry, which is collage poetry basically constructed from search results mm. from search engines. Um, and it's a way of outsourcing you know, the creative connections that I was talking about earlier that you make in your own work as a poet to um, 
Google and what you know what might Google randomly throw up if you put bear and slippers in the search engine together and see what happens. Um, so I think writers have to think about responding to those new forms that are available out there in life rather than in in the literary realm as such without becoming swamped by them and without um, getting involved in some kind of foolhardy quest for immediate contemporary relevance mm. and abandoning a sense of formal history at the same time. So I think that's something I'm quite interested in as a reader as well as, as somebody who's writing. Mm. And that, that leads into what I wanted to ask Will about, which is about the new and, and uh, your relationship with um, sort of the, 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 the novel, as in the novel experiences and new kinds of things that <coughs> happen in the world around you and how you, how they sort of, do you consciously go out and find them or do you find that something finds its way into your work or? Do you affect both? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You want me to say more? No, just the, the, the novel has to be novel, you said, and you're also, um, I mean, I'm not, I don't just mean as a, as a literary work, but in terms of its response to the world we find ourselves living in, or are we, are we inevitably writing about the world as once it has become as formulated as memory? Um, and do we need to actively address that? Well, I think we do at the moment. I mean, uh, uh, they're on those. They're on that song. Uh, I think we do at the moment, but we're we're in a once in a four or five generation change right now. So it's you know, and, and the literary culture, including its formal properties, that uh, we we were educated in and believed in, it actually only really shivered into being uh, around the turn of the twentieth century, and only really crystallised probably in the interwar period. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's one of the kind of. Uh, curiosities really you might have thought that people everybody in this room or all people engaged in the literary world or all people engaged with the cultural world that we wouldn't be so purblind but we are uh, and the particular kind of purblindness we suffer from is a belief in the existence of a, uh, a continuity that is in fact illusory uh, you know so we're constantly struggling to believe in uh, the canonical uh, in the established, in the tradition, uh, uh, you know, and it takes many different guises in the academic community. People, you know, intertextuality is really just another form of that search for uh, a kind of deep laid tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I personally believe we are at a major break point. Uh, so um, it is a problem. I think that, that uh, both Deborah kind of pointed up this problem, I mean, it, that is a genuine problem because the texture, the impact of the web on, on people's lives is manifold. It affects them in their social being, in their perceptual being, uh, in their political being. I would argue it even affects people metaphysically. Uh, and are you going to register that by including people's tweets in your text? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's exactly as you characterize it. It's a real problem. But it's not a problem that uh, I believe in this particular case a writer can really resile from. I think you can look back, say, over the last hundred years and you can see that certain kinds of particularly technical, technological changes you could afford not to register in a way. They weren't necessarily relevant to the key issues of subjectivity and interpersonality that literature tend to deal with. Uh, but these ones are, so, so that's a kind of major problem. I actually don't think it's a problem in the sense that I think the novel is pretty much over as a literary form. Uh, so, you know, something else is going to replace it that will be responsive to these new uh, perceptual phenomena and it's not going to be the novel so are you glad that you're living at this time oh yeah it's hugely exciting <laughs> hugely exciting it excites me if you think i'm joking about this i'm really not wait why can't novels just change 
Why does it well, have because, to because uh, uh, a literary form exists in relation to its social and material existence, and the platform for the novel is the codex. It's not the text, it's actually the physical book. Because there's no necessity for things to take the form of a volume in digital form. And indeed, young people are increasingly are not reading books in that way. Uh, it'll carry on the novel form, but it's going to be like classical music or poetry. Uh, it's is not. It, it's not. Isn't, it's isn't not going to have any cultural centrality. Wait, 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 but isn't classical music just the pop music for old? Like, isn't it? No, isn't it's it not case? pop music, but old. Oh. It's. It's. Uh, That's uh, what I thought it was. No, it, pop music. Well, actually, pop music is even not that central to our culture anymore. But it's uh, more uh, central than classical music for for a whole. But okay, so the popular music of the day in the time that classical music was written mm. is not... Is oh, you not mean you're, you're making a kind of high art, low Isn't art distinction? Well, no, I mean, you know, we're, we're in the cradle of, of classical music. It, we should, you know, note the fact that many of the things we think of as, as high-flown, high art classical music, of course, were, you know, Frere Jacques is what right. Mahler yeah. looked to for his first <laughs> symphony. You know, it's like, uh, you know... That the two are intermingled at the time. Mm. I think that leads me to what I want to talk to Helen about, which is what does um, tradition mean? Mm. Um, it's a small question. These are all such small questions. Um, but just kind of um, as you've been, I mean, you've been publishing since you were, how old were you when your first book came out? 17 or I, 18? Uh, I wrote it when I was 18. It yeah. came out when so I was 20. So at that point, you were still in the white heat of education, you yeah. know, that's, and, and so surrounded by ideas of the canon. And I mean, I know you, you read, didn't read English literature, but obviously yeah. you were deeply engaged with, with reading and books and so on. Yeah. And you were p probably being pumped full of ideas of tradition. And yet you out of this, at a very young age, you produced this work, which is this completely new structure. And so I was just really interested in, in asking you a bit about, as, as, as such a young you know, emerging writer, uh, what, how you negotiated tradition. Uh, Which is probably something you're not conscious of. But no, I just, I feel like actually. I just leapfrogged over it. Um, oh, when I was writing my first book, I was just kind of, I remember I wanted, I've been reading a lot of Poe, I wanted to write a doppelganger story um, so I did, <laughs> and, it, and it was just as easy as that. Um, but more recently, because what I've been getting into is retelling fairy tales, um, and that has actually been quite heavy. Um, but so it's only um, reading people like Marina Warner, Maria Tata, Tata, um, who just kind of opened doors for me in that way, um, conceptually, um, that have kind of relieved the heaviness of the fairy tale because when you think about what a fairy tale is, um, even, it, even in its repetitions, it kind of locks in. Um, I suppose fairy tales are quite, quite intensely linked with ideas of nationality and um, of roots deep in the woods and, and our people and like all of this stuff. And the way that I retell fairy tales is so completely different. Like I take them out of context. Um, and I put them in different times, and I change voices, and I just switch everything up. Um, but somehow, the tale, the structure of the tale itself persists. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something about the power of fairy tales, it's something about the teller. Um, one thing that happened a couple of summers ago was I came across this really strange fairy tale, um, and I wrote to Ali, to Ali Smith, saying, I found this really weird fairy tale, and she was like, tell me about it. So. I wrote it, I rewrote the fairy tale, and um, she got back to me, and the bits that she liked the best, or the bits that she remarked upon, were the bits that I had made up. Mm -hmm. Because as I was retelling it, I, was, I wasn't even able to retell it straight. <laughs> like I, just, I just went completely wonky. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's something in me that's at odds with tradition, but at the same time, I really enjoy it. Like I really, really enjoy it. Um, it there's something, it's, it's like Earth, um, and I think that, yeah, it sort of repels you and, and at the same time supports you. So it's a kind of net that you can, you can go through breaking certain bits and then leaving the bits that feel true. 
Um, that was all very vague, but yeah. It wasn't. It was, no. it was absolutely right. And the sort of surprise of which bits do feel true. Yeah. And that, and, and that over time still the, work. The legitimacy and worth of parts of what you write. Um, there's, n there's no sort of uh, correlation between those and the sense that the authenticity with which they arrived in the work, that it, they could be almost like a, a side thought or a joke and it become really... Yeah, they suddenly become solidified, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, Philip, I, I'm thinking about... I, one of the questions was, can writing escape form? And I was thinking about the various forms in which you've worked, I mean, from biography through to this sort of finding form, and and just um, picking up on words. I mean, I think Deborah you used the word innovation, which you sort of held away as you said it, the way I would hold away the word creative when I <laughs> said it. Those two words. There's so much lazy emphasis on an idea of innovation, um, but you used a more interesting word, which is reinvention. But that that raises questions around: Are we taking something and Make changing it completely, or are we reconstituting? Um, and I wondered if you'd like to say a little bit around that kind of thing, yeah, or something uh, else entirely. <laughs> I find it very frustrating if I read something which is straining to be innovative. You know, mm. you, you can feel it, and it's very, it's very wearing on the reader. Um, but I think, given what Will was saying and everyone else really, the notion of um, well, I think it's a really exciting period, um, possibly not for the same reasons as Will, or possibly the same, because um, the access you have to all sorts of narratives and imagery, I mean, it's astonishing if you think f even just 200 years ago, the images you would have seen during your daily experience, you could have counted on almost, you know, fingers of one hand. And now you see a million in images in an hour, probably. Um, so what effect that has on you know, the changing way that we realize what our creative outputs are? I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that people are writing far more now than they ever did. I mean, that's quite it's an extraordinary thing. <laughs> it's alarming, but it's brilliant. Yeah. And it's, uh, I only started using Twitter last year. I was very resistant to it, and my publishers were very keen for me to do it. And I love it now. And I only tweet my swims. So, uh, 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 so it's really, really boring, but I find <laughs> different ways of doing it, and it's really great. I've got quite a lot of followers. I mean, obviously, some people find it vaguely interesting. I don't care what they think. I really like doing it. It's really great. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, everything. I mean, I'm sure we all keep notebooks, you know, and, and your notebook is your little precious, isn't it, full of all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the question, the, the big question is how all that comes out in the end, really. It's like how you, how you digest it and how you either expel it. And how it digests or, or, you. Or, or, or how it digests you, exactly. That's yeah. probably to the point. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from you. So has anyone got a question? And, uh, you know, it could be a question to all of us or one of us. Uh, it could be general or specific questions. <laughs> You don't all have to run around the room and then ask questions. <laughs> well, it's quite a There's good idea. There's one over there. Um, I was wondering how you as authors feel um, with the, the new opportunities but maybe also m new responsibilities as public figures. You were mentioning Twitter, you said a bit about literary prizes being um, somewhere in the background um, and you're all here talking to us. So I was just wondering like, um, where do you see um, the benefits of this being a public figure and where would you sometimes like to say, oh, thanks, that's it, I'm a writer, read my books if you want to read it learn something from me. So being a, a public, the writer is public figure, what are the benefits for you, for your books? I don't know. Um, where do you stand on that, anybody? Anybody wants to? I think the two are actually connected, Twitter and 
the public figure. And if these writers gathered either side of me did not understand what they're facing, and they're very foolish people. Because just think about it in phenomenological terms. What the web offers is total literalism. That's what the culture of the image is. The culture of literature is a culture of, I put something into words, and you decode them back into the image that I encoded in them <coughs> in the first place. And a culture of total image coverage, which is what we're facing, is one of total literalism. So it squeezes out the place for the fiction. And the other more concomitant of that is that the writer becomes more significant as a personage than they do uh, as somebody who's capable of encoding feeling. All right? So it's inimical, actually. But the problem is we're all writers, even including Helen, who, who kind of came of age in a different conception of a literary culture. Now, this gathering has been going for a long time. It's august, so we won't trample on it. But the fact of the matter is that writers are becoming little snake oil salesmen who are required to go around on their hind legs and press the flesh. Why is that? Because the web culture, uh, because everything is available on the web for free, is one that means the only thing the writer has to sell anymore is their physical presence. And the only thing anybody want to buy anymore is propinquity to the writer, even though they're not particularly interested in the text. No, I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> I think, I think th there's, some, there's, some things we, there's some things we share. Probably, we want to know how one thing connects to something else. And we want, uh, and we want those connections to sometimes be mind-blowing and surprising, because they surprise us, and sometimes... Um, they're very uh, pedestrian. Uh, we want to know why we do weird stuff, why we um, slam doors, and we're not, we're not quite sure why, why, why we, we suddenly get very angry about the way someone looks at us. Um, there, are, um, there are mysteries that are I'm giving very sort of miniature mysteries, because why not? So we want to know more about that. And then just to contradict all of that knowing, I think that the most important thing right now, um, given that we live in such a psychologized culture, and I'm the worst one at it, I'm always at it, um, it might be very interesting to know nothing about ourselves. So if we just take that word home, which is used uh, so often, uh, which is used theoretically um, for so many agendas, if we decide that we have no idea what home means, I don't mean being faux naive, pretending to be more stupid, than we are. Uh, but I'll give you an example. There's so many women I know who put their lives energies into creating a home that they can no longer stand being in. So we could decide that uh, we don't know what home means. Obviously, uh, no, I, won't, I won't go off on that. So with the novel, it's not a matter of sort of saying, well, I don't know what the novel is, because any, every writer has a sort of few ideas of what, what they're going to get up to. Um, <clears throat> but that connecting conversation, how do things connect with other things? Why um, that, that um, tension, if you like, between coherence and incoherence, which is all of us, all of us here, never mind how often we tweet, uh, no matter how often we have to go on tour and sign our books, the conversation is about those ab about those things, and it's, the conversation is also about how, with everybody in this room, the past, our histories, walk with us into the present, and they make us behave in certain kinds of ways that are sometimes mysterious and sometimes not. Now. All of this 
is uh, much more important than Twitter and Google and all the rest of it because uh, I believe it's more important to us than Twitter. I'm not saying Twitter isn't enjoyable. I believe that it's what we think about. And just finally, there's a, there's a quote from Allen Ginsberg, the American beat poet, about poetry. And he says, uh, poetry is not about uh, expressing the party line. It's about that time of night you lie in bed thinking what you really think, making the private public. That's what poetry is. Now, that is easier said than done, thinking what we really think, uh, making the private public. That's hard, but that's, that's why we're here. Thank you. Uh, would no, I, I just know it's really interesting. And also, you can't choose the audience, really. You, mm. you know, that's, that's not your choice. Um, and it's interesting to hear Will talk. And Will, you're the most public face here, mm. which well, is quite what interesting. The hell are you talking about? Music spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and, and media presence and the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting, you know, for you to be able to take that. But I mean. Listen, if I had the sales, <laughs> if I had the sales, I'd never go out. It's as simple as that. Okay, Philip. Yeah. Well, uh, I love going out. It gets me out. <laughs> <laughs> gets me out. In, uh, in, uh, and I derive a great deal of pleasure from uh, events such as this because, uh, you know, I never do meet my audience. I never, otherwise, I would never speak to people who, who are on the other end of what I'm doing. And I would never have that context, and I would never have that enjoyment. Um, because, but just satisfy my ego. Exactly. Yeah. about your ego. But so exactly. is your writing. <laughs> no, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's You've got a huge right, ego. Right, right. No, well, of course I've got a huge ego. But, but the point about writing, as I say, yeah. is the great mystery, and, and then Deborah really was living this in as well, mm. is that it is the most intimate relationship you can have with another person mm. that is a relationship with another person who is shorn of all contingent characteristics. Mm. It doesn't matter what their ethnicity is, their gender, their class, their sexual orientation, mm. their age, mm. or even potentially what era they're in. Mm. Uh, no. And yet you have mm. this intense intimacy. Mm. But why you do don't you need to go out and meet them. You're already going, you know, it's like what Ballard said when his kid said, uh, you know, I'm going to read one of your books, Dad. He said, don't do that. That's far too intimate a relationship for yeah. a child to have with his parents. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> um, Francis. How do you feel about the public? Because your first book is called Public Dream, and we talked a bit this yeah. morning about moving between those those two states without the, the usual state we think of ourselves as existing in, but the sort of conscious but unobserved and uh, unenacting state in between public state and dream state. But do you? How's your sort of? How do you feel about the public self? And I think I think it's something that I'm growing into. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm more interested in, and I think I feel uh, this, w I'm aware of how pompous this sounds, but I f I'm aware of a growing sense of responsibility that oh, if, if you want, <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm not going yeah. if you, if you want a meaningful literary culture, you have to contribute to creating it. So if you want, when you publish a book, there to be uh, thoughtful reviews of it, if you want there to be public discussions about art and the creation of art, then I feel that at some point you have to be willing to put yourself forward and say, all right, I'll contribute to that discussion. I'll be one of those people who reviews books. I will try and that be a tiny drop in that ocean of reception uh, in some way. And I, so I, f I feel that most of the, the public stuff I do is really um, reviewing and writing essays and, and some of these kind of discussion occasions, which is really an opportunity to talk about books in a way that I think is meaningful. Mm. Um, and if, and if, it's, if it's meaningful to other people, that, that's great. Thank you. I'm not sure what else to say about that, really. That was <laughs> very nice. Helen, do you have anything you'd like to add about the public self? 
Um, I was thinking I don't even know if I have a private self. Like I just feel like I'm a really like alienated individual, <laughs> and I feel as if in a lot of ways I read fiction to reassure myself that I am a person. I think I think that stories, engaging in stories, is my way of becoming a person and becoming mm. other people, mm. and just you know the, trying to get in touch with whatever humanity I, I supposedly have like back, back and, and feeling like part of something for a moment, blah, 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 all of that stuff. Um, so to then take that step to public figure is just a bit much for me, I think. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, one Cortina and then the, the gentleman. Uh, can I ask you to think a bit about the relationship between form and content? Um, and uh, when Will was talking, it struck me that actually a lot of what you're talking about is a change in the content of our lives. And um, I think it's, uh, just just to be controversial, I don't think many novels at all actually address that change in the content of our lives. A lot of the best-selling novels, you would not know that we had, we would even that we had the internet, that we had mobile telephones, that we had Twitter, that we had Facebook. It just doesn't come into most of the novels that actually sell big numbers. Now, is that because the novel can't deal with that change in the content of our lives, or is it just that the novel isn't choosing to deal with that change in the content of our lives? Are your novels about the world? <laughs> yeah, they are. People watch telly in them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Helen, do you want Have to say? Have you read them? Yes. Well, I what do you think? <laughs> I, we're not going to do that here because I want to hear what other people <laughs> have to say. You can have it right back at you. Uh, and you must have an opinion. Are they about the world or not? Yes, I think they are about the world. Okay, good. Okay, but I was asking you because you were. Um, I wanted. I, I wasn't challenging your statement. I was asking you because you are somebody who talks about the death of the novel and goes on writing novels and so on, which I think is an entirely healthy but position I, I, to be I, in. So, but this die. is not the Will <coughs> Self show. So, I'd like to <laughs> um, move move past that, perhaps. Um, I actually think I'm still mulling this one over, so Philip. Oh God, oh my. What was the question again? Uh, the relationship between form and content and it's changing. Yes, the, the Cortina was asking about how, how well, say, observing how few novels she reads where people have the internet yeah. or mobile yeah. or sort sure. of well, Twitter. Yeah. If we're going no. to well, it's, or it's, I mean, I mean, they appear as plot devices, don't they? I mean, it's very interesting how, uh, how theatre changed as soon as the telephone arrived, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, then it's changed again now. And it's very funny when you see films now pre-mobile phones and, you know, people are saying, you know, we've got to send a message, you mm -hmm. know, to someone. And so all those mechanics, you know, are very different now. Um, and it's very interesting to think how that actually, um, that really hasn't filtered through, I don't think, mm -hmm. really, not into not into our grown-up fiction world. I mean, it mm. probably is uh, loads of other places yeah. that we're not even discussing now, you know. But um, so, yeah, who knows? But, I mean, are we talking about realism here, then? I mean, what, 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 sh what are we talking about? So are we, there are lots of things that happen in the world uh, that you could put in a novel, oiling hinges to a door, um, you know, um, making this glass bottle. I mean... What, what are you thinking? Our, our lives have tra changed enormously. I mean, in my, even in the last, my daughter, she's 20, in her lifetime we've gone from basically no internet to the internet. That mm. is an extraordinary change, which I think we haven't computed yet. Mm. I don't think that's been addressed in, in novels at all. It's more than, I, forgive me, but I think it's more than just about hinges. I think it's a much more fundamental change in the way we live. It, it, it's not I, I want, it's yeah. Yeah. Well, incommensurable with the form, that's what mm. I'm saying. But there's also the question of it's like you know the fact that 
when you write dialogue in a novel, it it there's that odd thing that happens whereby in order for it to sound like dialogue, you don't write down exactly how people speak. That and it's not a conscious process of thinking I'm writing dialogue now, but in the making of art, there is this odd cause and effect thing that mm. happens. And I wonder if you know this thing because when I mean Deborah, I think somebody mentioned that that in the making novel or the the, the um the desire to to be real about the world we live in, uh, it, you can come across a very strained kind of effect where people are deliberately putting in brand names or yeah. um, mentioning certain devices or cultural references simply in order to, to make the thing fresh. And that's not where the freshness comes from. That's not where the new comes from, but that's, that's part of something. And that's where I think, will your novels do absolutely manage to to um, it, it address address the new and make the form fit it without it feeling like you've imported the new for, for its own sake. But I do think it has some relation to simply what the form is and how we absorb fiction. And so that reading dialogue on a page sounds like conversation to us, whereby if people were saying those exact words in the street, it wouldn't sound right and vice versa. And it perhaps has something to do with the transition of life into art that works through memory and the formulations that take place in memory. And so it makes it particularly difficult to add the very immediate new. Um, somehow, uh, I mean, Will can do it. I certainly can't do it. I find it very difficult um, to, to sort of take, take things there and put them in without them somehow looking unprocessed and yes, wrong. But I, Which isn't I, to say I avoid the new, but I know I know it's something I find difficult. How do you even think about the new? I, you know, I, I think in a way, uh, I think that is very strange. But going to going to dialogue, um, dialogue in the novel is is has notoriously always been pretty bad. No one interrupts each other. Yeah. Everybody finishes their sentences. Um, all that kind of thing, and. Um, so and they um, punctuate them as well. So, so you know, I've been in, interested in, in dialogue for years, partly because I trained in the theatre, and um, and and you know, and how I made my name to begin with was in the theatre, and the form that I inherited was a form of theatre that didn't have the stage curtain, the stage curtain that told us that at the show's beginning, and then there's a middle, the interval, and, and the end. Um, and that um, showed to the audience all the mechanics of the stage, the staging. You know, people would come in and take out their own uh, furniture and all of that. So, because I had that weird training, it was a theatre training to be a playwright, um, Form was always very much, um, I was very preoccupied by form because what was around at the time in the late 80s was naturalism and social realism and the kind of theatre and performance that I wanted to write for was much more like Pina Bausch's work or Heiner Muller's work. It was influenced by Beckett and Pinter and all of the rest of it. So when I started to write novels, I had no idea there was any other way to write except modernism. I didn't go around saying, do you know what? I, I write modernist novels because it was the air I breathed. It was what I'd grown up in. It didn't occur to me that there was anything else to write in. So that was my tradition. And it was a tradition that I then set to work with. Um, you know, through through the different phases of, of, of my writing life. It's what I've always been working with and what I'm always trying to, um, uh, I think renew isn't right, actually. I think you just think harder, think harder and write harder. Yeah. Um, but that's my tradition. And that's how, and, and, and that's when I, mean, I words like art fullness and artifice yeah. are always used in the pejorative and I don't think they should be um, and that we are there is a sort of especially if you are going to to make your 
work to, to break it down and open it up sufficiently for it to embrace the, say, you know, the actuality mm. that we live with, then it requires art to do that. Um, and that this idea that, that, that the clearest communication of the real is through a very simple direct method, I think, mm. is another one of the peculiar ways in which art operates on us and through us, really. Um, anyone else want to go into that, or should we go to another question? Another question. Yeah. There was um, <laughs> someone up there, yes, just back there, to... I'll repeat your question. Then. Or I can get up if you want to. Yeah. Um, the, it is picking up the question about the impact of the digi digital. Um, okay, now I can say it on again. Um, <coughs> the change in, in the form of our interaction, which has been brought about by this, by the new digital uh, modes of interaction that we have. And I would like to throw out two points one to the poets, uh, or the, the question about poetry, and one about. Um, uh, to the novelists about the implications. Um, it might, it seemed to me that uh, what might be going on is that the distinction between public and private that has been fundamental to what Francis suggested and what you, Deborah, picked up, that that distinction is no longer going to be and um, you know, because um, we, here we have someone tweeting about when they go swimming, that's making the private public. And we have uh, we're in the middle of um, of a process in which this is very um, interesting. Do we now? We can hear you. You know, in which um, um, in which our private is about to become as public as possible, and there won't be any, uh, there won't be much private left. So that would be a test to the poets, and I think the implication would be what you have also heard this morning on the news that Facebook, those people who use Facebook. Um, are now by logic on agreeing that Facebook can research their digital profile basically comprehensively. So that opens up new, whole new perspectives for characterization. You know, Facebook can do a complete characterization of you, which is which changes how people can do characterization or will do characterization in novels, maybe. I'm not sure, I'm what, not sure what your your, your question is or why particularly to poetry. I mean, I'm. I'm okay, but you specifically asked about poetry, so. Thank you, Francis. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to address that in terms of the stuff I was discussing earlier about the poetry being a, a, a place in which private and public are interfacing with each other and, and, and affecting each other. Um, I think you're right, obviously you're right, that our sense of privacy is changing um, and that we are perhaps giving away a lot of the territory that previously we would have claimed as private and allowing that to go into the public sphere. So absolutely that is changing. I don't think that changes the fact that um, with my consciousness is um, untouchable to you. Yes, right. Isn't. Sorry, hang, Sorry. On, hang on a minute. Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking my thoughts, and you're not in my mind. You're not thinking my thoughts, right? So that there's, there's, there's a, a, a the basic issue of subjectivity that, that I don't, I don't think you can transcend. And to that, to that extent, there is um, a private self that is inaccessible to you, and that remains the case whether I decide to tweet about going swimming or not. Um, but in terms of the, that gradations of what you put out there and who can access it and who can read it, yes, I mean, obviously that's changing, but I don't, I don't feel as if um, that's... Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say I don't feel that it's, it's fundamentally changing lyric poetry, but I, I, do, I do feel that that's the trafficking between public and private that lyricism is engaged mm. with remains... Um, yeah, remains, it remains a huge part of the work. 
But I if, think if oh. you took a um, <sighs> Sylvia Plath poem, I'm just, I, I, was, I was just thinking when Frances was talking. So if we take her poem, Couriers, about her wedding ring, mm. and she says, um, I think, lies, oh, oh, a band of gold with the sun in it forever, lies, 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 and a grief. Well, we could tweet that. That's very private. When but she wrote not. that, and it was, and it was, and it was. Well, actually, when she wrote that, I, I experienced that as, as really, you know, quite, quite personal. And uh, so, when I read that poem, <laughs> a band, you could say, a band of gold with the sun in it forever, has given us some distance because she hasn't gone my wedding ring, mm. but she does then write mm -hmm. lies lies, lies, and a grief. It's very private. I think there's uh, one of the many things uh, that, that, that people attach to poetry is an idea that it is the, that it is the private and it's not an enactment of the lyrics. You know, that, that go back to Philip Sidney, I am not I, pity the tale in me. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. When I was, I remember being asked mm -hmm. early on, why, why are you, you know, what you, you're showing us, it's like you're showing us pages of your diary. Well, no, I'm not. I am using my experience and my coordinates to, to create something which will just convey an essential experience for which you will have your own coordinates. But I'm doing it in the lyric mode, which is a mode of intimacy. I am not exposing my private self. Francis is not exposing her private self. Philip is not exposing his private self by saying, you know, I went swimming today and I saw these, these things. Um, and I think that there is, that, that all these modes, um, the intimacy and an intimate experience and connection are a vital part of, of what we do and what the writer responds to, but do not mistake the lyric poet for themselves. And I think Plath is somebody, and I don't think Deborah was doing this at all, but the reason I was sort of getting edgy is because because like Sable, I was saying this morning, he's an extraordinary writer and a terrible influence. Plath is another one. Because this idea that you could just sort of vomit yourself up onto the page, which people take from Plath, which is absolutely not what she's doing. Mm -hmm. She is going to the absolute dark heart of herself, mm -hmm. but she is an extraordinary technician. And she knows how to use that mm -hmm. to very, very precisely. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what poets, yeah. poets who can do that, it, like, it looks as if you're reading sort of the bleeding stuff that's been pulled up and onto the page, mm. but you're not. If it works, you're not. And, that, and that's what, what, when I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, uh, I don't have a phone. Mm. So I, I write, I compose my tweets, and I take quite a long time <laughs> over the composition of it. It's not preaching, and it's issued with, through a person who is called Philip Hoare, which of course is not my name anyway, uh, through an image of me, which is a drawing, uh, through a medium which reaches to people who have selected to go on it and know what they are getting from me there. That's, there's so many filters there between, as you say, you know. I'd, I'd just like to come back to Lavinia <laughs> here. Um, yes, absolutely, because, um, you know, uh, <laughs> if you have no technique and skill and you just have feelings, um, you know, you know that, that that's going to be difficult. But I, I, I actually want to keep on the personal here. Never in my life did I think I would be in front of an audience doing this, saying, "No, let's 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 keep keep there." What about Louise Bourgeois? What about the sculptor? Let's take it right out of literature and and all the rest of it. Um, she said, people would come up to her and they say, uh, "Why do you make art?" And she said, because my emotions are bigger than I am. But that Is there anything? And then we have to look at the sculptures. And the sculptures are, are bigger. <laughs> and they're much bigger than Louise Bourgeois. And we know, we know the incredible skill um, and, and detachment and all the rest of it. She, she studied geometry at the Sorbonne because she found geometry 
structures. Emotional. But I'm not She's saying that we should, um, we should I, not I start understand, in feeling. But I'm not running away from it either. No, I'm not. And when, actually, I when spend you a lot write, of my time yeah. teaching people to, yeah. to connect back to that. I mean, uh, when you teach writing, you think you're going to be teaching discipline, and, and, but actually, a lot of the time, you're teaching people to keep absolutely connected to that deep self, but also to know what to do with it, but, but how to keep that connection open in what, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Deborah. Did you um, talk, yeah. talk more about feeling? Oh, but you started saying geometry as emotional, and mm. I thought that was kind of was that was that at the end of the thought. Mm. Very formal. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Oh, there are two questions. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, over over there. Um, how do you account for the following? Um, on the one hand, as Will Self pointed out, the novel is a historical phenomenon. It came into being, and therefore it must one day be on the way out, like the tragedy, tragedy, <laughs> like um, the heroic epic or whatever. Um, and why is that so? You said it came to being because of its material form, the printing press, the form of the book, etc., but also because it's bound to bourgeois society and it negotiated conflicts between self, not will self, but self <laughs> and society, or possibly between the private and the public. And we have possibly no longer those uh, sharp conflicts or that clear between the private and the public. Um, that's the one point. The other point is, on the other hand, novels are on the increase the quantity of novels. Mm. The, author, uh, the, the readership is shrinking. We might have average sales of between three and 6,000 uh, copies of a novel in this country. I don't know. Um, but the authorship is growing. If we had, I don't know, 100 novelists in 1800 maybe per nation, we now have 10,000 novelists, or at least would-be novelists. How do we explain that? That on the one hand, it seems, historically speaking, a dying form, and you mentioned that, but actually speaking, it's... Um, we, we are surrounded by novels, not by poetry. Yes, I mean, that's how you register your death of a fall. <laughs> thousands upon thousands of stillborn novels. That's what shows you that it's about to die out. It can't replicate itself except in a substandard form. Uh, and it's the terminal terrain at the end of literature. And, and teaching creative writing is a big part of that process. It's about disseminating the botched form to a, a wider... But, you know, it's a very, very evanescent thing, as you've rightly indicated. The novel depends upon copyright. It depends upon the codex. It depends upon web offset printing, which only comes in in the late 19th century. It depends upon the paperback, Alan Day's paperback coming in in the 1940s. It's actually a very short-lived phenomenon. Uh, and it is about to be transcended, but, you know, that's okay. I mean, it'll still, people will still go on writing novels. The more you say about the public and the private, most people are discussing, actually, the form that the novel or literature imposes on subjectivity. They're not actually talking about subjectivity because they're talking from within what Marshall McLuhan called the Gutenberg mind. You know, and the Gutenberg mind. Recall St. Augustine coming upon Bishop Ambrose in the fourth century, and Bishop Ambrose was reading silently. Augustine had never seen this phenomenon before. Now, it's easy to see the connection between silent reading and your Francis's idea that her, her consciousness is in some sense inviolate. She thinks it's inviolate because she thinks that like a book, it can be closed and therefore it can't be read. But that's just actually something that comes from the book. The truth of the matter is that we all have different views about what consciousness is or might not be. And the absolute privacy of the subjective perspective is certainly not something I believe in at all. Anyone else want to come in on that, Helen? Uh, no, I think Frances's consciousness is inviolate. I think if you can't say for sure what's going through her mind, then it is inviolate. And you can't say for sure, like you can guess, but it's not a good guess. Um, about books and public and private, I think, I think novels are probably think could probably make quite a good cast at the moment. What's that? <laughs> 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 Just as a thought, I think. Bear with me, though. Hang on, we'll, hang on, Helen's Helen's okay. talking. It was it was just a very short point, and then we can go back to this. But it was just. <laughs> 
I, I just think novels are probably quite a nice place um, between public and private. Like they're semi-private. Like especially now, I think you could write a novel and you know fewer people would read it than if you tweeted, um, probably. So people have to come and meet you in this little place that's called a novel, and I think that that's, that kind of appeals to people. So you're not entirely alone, um, but maybe you'll have five or six people come, <laughs> and maybe that's why peop yeah. more people are writing so novels. So it becomes a private To place. sort of invite, <laughs> yeah. That's Very all. nice, but interesting. Uh, there was uh, another question here, and then, and then there. So just at the front here on, on your right. Well, why do you think the novel has no future? Uh, one could say, uh, uh, I mean, I, I agree that there is something going on mm -hmm. that uh, frees the novel of its obligation and its ties to the idea of identity formation, uh, uh, Western style. I mean, ever since it was invented, so to speak, as a form, I think people have started to think about their lives novelistically. They, they reconstructed their past and projected themselves into the future according to the patterns provided by the novels. And that reached a kind of high point in the 19th century. Then the form got under pressure and modern, modern novel writing reacted to it. Uh, but it was still under the kind of almost moral obligation uh, uh, that, that stemmed from its connection with with the idea that we are all sort of individuals and, and uh, identities uh, formation. Now, uh, I think there is a, an, a, a, a widening split between identity and individualism. We can have identities without the type of individualism we had as a kind of, you know, this kind of type of Western uh, European, uh, basically, uh, identi uh, individualism. And the novel will live on, and what we see, the, you know, the, the airport novels, this kind of crime and detective, the massive increase of this kind of stuff, which spills over into the other media, yeah, it, that, that they live on the fact that that has nothing to do with the reality of people anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a market for that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm not uh, talking about that. I'm talking about the series novels. Mm -hmm. What do we well, call the series novels? Yeah. Well, um, uh, literature as a form that deals with with, with the realities, that, that's, that's the formula. No, but I think you put it very well. You can have plenty of novels now about identity. That's fine. That's, that's very much the zeitgeist. But why do I... Why do you write novels still? I mean, that's an open it's question. It's all I know how to do. It's I've not a hostile doing. question. No, it's, it's all I know how to do. I've okay, been training for, for years. I'm too old for a skill, skills yeah. transfer. <laughs> but it, I tell you and something, you if I were 20 years younger, Mm -hmm. I would seriously be thinking about moving into different forms, yeah. Have absolutely. you ever taught? Hmm? Do you ever teach? Teach what? Writing. Have you ever taught absolutely writing? Absolutely not. <laughs> what it's, do it's you think... Any, um, any writer should be an autodidact. Do you think any think. artist should be an autodidact? Any composer should be an autodidact? I think there are formal aspects of composition and painting, that, and, and actually writing that can be... Yeah, in, that's, I mean, that's the but, only, but only reason I think... But nobody who's any good needs to learn those. Else. Really? So you don't think, you think writing, unlike any other art form, there is nothing to be gained from any kind of training? Well, not, not for the elite practitioners, no. So the elite practitioners are autodidacts, yeah. are solely? Necessarily. Maybe and through contact with other books, other authors, other, their reading? Yeah. That, so that's not, or, I mean, that's actually learning in, through engagement and interaction. Yeah, but it's not something that is set up as a formal didactic program. The point about the creative writing movement is that it's Sorry. piggybacked itself onto academia because it's a cash cow for academia. It's a kind of horrible symbiosis. But you, so writers you can't make a living, so they teach other writers who, in due course, will be unable to But you, do, but you think, <laughs> but you true. don't think the same about <laughs> learning to paint or learning ballet or learning musical well, some composition. Of those, some of those Economically yes, but also within the world of um, creative writing, there will, you know, there are there exists the chance for people to have the kind of formal training they would have at art school or the conservatoire. Well, yeah, that, that's right, and then there can be Sunday writers like Sunday painters, but that's not how creative writing sells itself. You get it, no, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Because I meet them. No, but you don't meet the people who teach it who would never in a million no, years say, come here and you'll be published or, or come here and, and no, you'll produce a book. Well, excuse me, but there's quite a lot of people teaching writing who would never 
of who, whose intentions and, and the way they teach are completely opposite to that, and who would never say, come here and you'll be James Joyce. I don't even say, come here and I don't teach anymore, but I would never have said, come here and you'll produce a book. But I wouldn't have said it was a waste of time either. I agree with you. There's a, there is, like in all these worlds, I mean, there yeah, are many art schools. Out. There are many. I'm just looking at it as a sociocultural phenomenon. I just think you're generalizing um, in a way that's. Uh, that I feel the responsibility as someone who has taught to and who does think about about the way that writing <coughs> the 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 you know the sort of training that one can have in those formal aspects that you say are somehow less important in writing or can be achieved by an elite situation well, is, is you just uh, have to look at the, the, the cultural, social and economic reality of what people are doing. It's very important. But you, uh, so I'm, I was talking we were talking about how people become writers. Um, well, one of the reasons people become writers, you know, to, to come back to, to what Yogan was saying, one of the reasons why this has happened is because we had copyright, we had extremely efficient distribution methods and replication of text, and for a brief moment in, in Western culture, it was possible for somebody to write a kind of reasonable but not particularly good book every two or three years and make a kind of middle class living out of it. And, that, and that, that's what made this whole phenomenon shiver into being. And you're part of that? Yes, when I was a young man setting out on a literary career, that was the paradigm. It mm. was possible to make a living that way. And I think that enormously influenced even things like form. It, it colossally mm. influenced it. Mm. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just... A Marxian heuristic. No, uh, no I think it's, a very sh it's very much a common view, but I was just... Um, saying that you are within, you, are, you know, you're talking about your own self as well, and from within that, rather than from outside it. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm, but I, I, I'm against all this subjectivism. I don't think. What, sub what, what subjectivism? I just, I was well, just I, saying I that you are the one of. Objective conditions that obtain. In what objective? Who said there were any? <laughs> Sorry. No, no. I, I mean. So oh, yeah, Jürgen, we, you, we, you were we talking earlier wanted. about identity and the identity <laughs> of the novel. <laughs> well, I don't believe that the identity of anything can be guaranteed. Identity is one of these words like home. Um, so we could say um, that uh, I'm a bit from here, a bit from there, that I have multiple identities. I come from two different continents and all the rest of it. And that in a way, uh, so, so that's an unstable identity, all very fashionable, you know. However, I don't believe that identity can be sort of signed off and guaranteed in the same way that I want to, us to sort of reimagine all over again what home is. So I would say that the identity of the novel, and there are many, many of the novels you describe, and uh, presumably we're here to talk about serious novels. There are not very many of them. Um, the identity of the novel cannot be guaranteed. And if we can accept that we live with this uncertainty, that's quite exciting for writers and readers. Deborah, can I just quickly ask, and, and, and Will as well, what is a serious novel? Mm. I, I um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. You know, I talked earlier about getting into trouble with my exercise books. Um, I've, I've never really thought that writing is just about covering a page. If you have a facility with words, you can cover a page very easily, and you can get, you know, you can do 400 and 500 of them. Never I've never believed it's just about sort of giving information. Um, so it's not about covering a page. Um, and um, and it's not just about telling a story. So, um, well, I mean, we is it something that it does, does or something that it is? is my I, do, I, do, I don't want to kind of uh, uh, nail myself <laughs> to the serious, to defining the serious novel. And, um, you know, 
uh, I'm not going to do that. But I think we all. We, no, I think we. I do, well, okay, but basically. you could just say in your, in my what opinion. You're not, you're not going to get hauled up as you're sort of coming back into Britain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you tried to find a serious novel. We're not letting you back. Here. No. I think I think Will, I think Will, you are um, in a good place because you're sort of depressed with the novel. You've lost your curiosity, apparently, but not actually between the pages. Um, why all the certainty? This is what I want to ask you all. Why do we need all the certainty about what the novel is and what it isn't? Because if I was going to have to write, sit down, go through the hell of writing a novel, <laughs> which is what I'm doing at the moment, <laughs> I just thought, oh, this is all very certain. It's all guaranteed. Um, I would really go and do something else. Well, we talked so about that. Sorry, mm. we talked about that this morning yeah. with with Philip, who found out that he had inadvertently predicted what he was going to write about <laughs> when he was fourteen, <laughs> and felt quite depressed that he'd known <laughs> all along, and this sense of having known all along. So yeah. 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 I think I, if I may, I can define the series. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> In the Western tradition. The serious novel is always a philosophic novel. And if you think of the great novels in the Western tradition, they necessarily address major philosophic questions in one way or another. You can go back to the Quixote, to Gargantua of Pantagruel, you can come forward, uh, go wherever you like, go to Kafka, go to Proust, go to Joyce, go to Wolf, I don't care where you go. If it's serious, it, ad it addresses the fundamental philosophical question. <coughs> Why are we here? What are we doing? Does God exist? What is the nature of space and time? These are the sorts of things that the novel is absolutely fit to deal with and does deal with. And that's why it's been such an important and vigorous literary tradition is because it finds a way of dealing with major philosophic questions in a way that people can strongly empathize with. And that's where its success lies. Novels that don't and that's why we say at the beginning, echoing Pound, we say make it new. Why do we say make it new? Because everybody has to re-encounter those questions, not just once or twice in their lives, but all the time. Uh, and this is a form that is well adapted to doing it. Uh, so if a novel isn't prepared <coughs> to encounter and deal with some of these questions, then it's pas sérieux, it's not serious. And is, is not serious bad? No, it's just different. Oh. <laughs> Helen, is there any? It can be entertaining, it can be ludic, it can be amusing, it can be sexy, it can be funny, mm. but it, it isn't serious. Okay. Would you like to say anything? <laughs> no, that was, that's fair enough. That was <laughs> yeah. very clear. Thank you, Will.